All right, um, it is 7.30 and welcome everyone. So nice to see people and hear people um, uh, and um, real on a very exciting night. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you all for joining. But um, more importantly, I wanted to thank Peter for taking time um, and, and, and coming to this uh, presentation as well and discussing and actually showing a lot of amazing photographs that he has taken over the time. Um, it is singularly my honor to have him here, to, to be very honest. Uh, I, I, I wanted to introduce Peter as a different person today. In fact, uh, I'll, I'll say he's a great photographer and people know him in the field and they've seen his amazing work. If you have seen his Instagram photos and things like this on YouTube, I'm just amazing. Um, I have to say something that probably many of you know um, if you have met Peter. He is an amazingly kind person and, and an extremely, extremely helpful person too. Very helpful, not just you know, discussing about birds or photography, but in general, philosophy in life. I, I was really lucky to have carpool with him and we, we talked so much about different things. So uh, truly an honor to know you, Peter. And it was very, very exciting to see your name uh, as the amateur award winner for Audubon last year. Um, actually this year, sorry in 2022, very excited to see, um, you, you know, you, you see you win this award and share your stories with us. Uh, you know, you, I have seen your photographs uh, whenever you shared them on Facebook, Instagram, emails, text and whatnot, but uh, this group will certainly enjoy uh, your lessons and what you have learned about photos in the Bay Area and, and how you created a haven for yourself in, in your house. So. Without further ado, I, I, and I hope certainly everybody's able to hear me okay. And, and uh, Peter, if you don't mind just saying hello and see if your audio is working fine. Okay, thank you very much for having me here. I really appreciate that. Um, I guess now I need to figure out how am I going to share my... Yes, so I, I made you the co-host, so I'm going to stop sharing this one slide and you should be able to share uh, from your laptop. Okay. Can everybody see my first screen? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. With the uh, yes. Mama Western grip. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much. I am. I feel very honored to be in this uh, presentation, and I wish to share with uh, all of you guys um, how I start birding and during this journey what I learned what I changed of my perception of burning wildlife photography and later on I take on a task that I want to convert our backyard into a bird paradise so I can enjoy to see all the birds come to our backyard also doing some photography. And, uh, but during the process, I encountered some difficulty and I made a lot of mistake and I will share the solution we came up with. <clears throat> and about eight years ago, I knew nothing about birding. I cannot call any bird's name. And when I see the crow, I say a black bird, that's it. Um, the outside of work and family for me, for many years, I was an avid weekend golfers, golfer. So uh, any weekend, if you wanna find me, I'm on a golf course. And I did that for 25 years until I injured my knee, my ankle, and my back, I developing a lot of problems due to overplaying the sport that I love. And I thought it was something I'm gonna be playing for the rest of my life. And I had to put a stop to it. So I started looking for a new hobby, but I know I want to do something outdoor. I want to be close to the nature. I like to be able to walk under the sun and, also dealing with the elements. 
But when there's a rain or windy day or cold or warm, I want to be part of that. I want to feel it. And I say, what can I do? So a friend say, how about uh, birding? So I took that advice and I start my first time I went out and uh, uh, um, it was truly a love at first sight. And later on, I will talk about transition into my backyard and this photo, a Rufus hummingbird, it was photographed from our backyard. Mm -hmm. And later on, I will share what I did. When I, did, uh, when I started my new hobby, I call it a hobby at the time, and I had no prior birding experience, zero knowledge, and I did not even have the camera set up for the wildlife photography. The longest lens I had was a 7200. I took that out, went to Coyote, uh, Coyote Hills Regional Park, and I noticed that there's a lot of birders with much longer lens. So the following week, I went out, I bought a Canon 100, 400 zoom lens and got a Canon 5D Mark III camera. That was how I started my birding journey eight years ago. But soon I discovered that as a birding wildlife photographer, we are so fortunate, lucky and lucky living in the Bay Area. We had an inland central valley in a short distance. We are to the ocean and we are surrounded by the bay and many local and migrating birds that provide year round and to, for us to explore and for our enjoyment to see all those wonderful birds. And I put a picture here, the bow eagle at Kerner School, because when I started birding, that was when the, the bow eagle decided to make a nest at a Kerner Elementary School. I, it blew me away. I was so, wow, I've never seen a bow eagle in my life at a time. So I go, wow, it's a, such a short drive to Melpitas that I can see that. And later on, we saw the drama, the sadness, the Pelican Falcons at the Berkeley School Campus, especially this year, if, if you guys following that. As I said, my first place ever been to, it was Coyote Hills Regional Park. And for me at the time, I had no idea where to look for birds. But of course, now we know birds are everywhere. Uh, could be on telephone pole, could be anywhere. But it was, I was so silly. I thought for us to see birds, you had to go to a certain place. That's how naive I was. I want to learn more about birding. So I joined some bird walk. My first time out, with a group, it was called Fremont Birding Circle. Not sure how many of you guys know about this Fremont Birding Circle group. It was started by a person called Jerry Dean. Now he's a dear friend of mine. And I remember the very first time I went out and he was so kindly explaining all the birds and ID. And when he hears something, he can call out the name. I was, I was bowled by his talent and burning knowledge, and he's also a very awesome, fantastic photographer. Right at that walk, I was hooked on burning. I almost want to say hooked on golf, hooked on burning. And I became religiously attending every month Fremont Burning Circle. And I remember at times Jerry laughed at me and say, Peter, you have a perfect attendance. Uh, on, uh, on our bird walks. That's how much I was so passionately about. As each year go by, I start gaining more knowledge, more understanding of the birding and wildlife photography. I want to explore more, but I want to start out with our neighborhood parks. And sometimes I go with a group. 
sometimes with few of my good friends. And I saw some of the people's name there. They're all my dear friends, many, many of you, that I went to bird walk with you. And uh, most of the time in the last couple of years, I've been birding with my buddy, Arnold Joe. I want to point it out, he's a very talented birder. And he's very intelligent, very smart. And I learned a lot from him. He's a dear friend of mine. And sometimes I also enjoy going out alone. When I walk alone on the shoreline or at a park, when there's no one else around me, that feeling can be peaceful and relaxing. It's something that I truly enjoy. Here is a picture of the murmuration of the Western sandpipers with a backdrop of San Francisco cityscape. And I observed this on a trail uh, in San Lorenzo. I seems like not many people know about this trail. It is north of the Hayward shoreline. And when I'm observing this and everything happens so quickly, the time they start murmuration, it flew by with a cityscape and passing. Everything happened within a few seconds. And I feel very fortunate that I was able to get this shot. And I also found out the more time I spend it on the field, the luckier I get. Now, in the past, I just mentioned about Hayward Shoreline. In the past, there are many wildlife photographers go to Hayward Regional Park for the short year owl in the past few years. But, in the, but nowadays, seems like short air owl decide to move to somewhere else. So I don't see many photographers at this park anymore, but I still enjoy going to this park uh, uh, frequently. It is close by our house, short distance. I don't even need to get on the freeway. At this park, I found the, you can see, uh, uh, I, it was the first time I saw the uh, snowy plover quite closely. And I saw the black belly plovers and Roddy turnstone. And one minute, I was, I spent about 30, one morning, I spent about 30 minutes to, re, to observing this Roddy turnstone. It was the first time I truly understood why they named it turnstone, because he was actually turning each stone, searching for the food. And I hope, I'm gonna play a short video um, maybe, I'm not sure the quality, but hopefully you will see the turnstone turning stones. Oops. And I hope uh, you guys were able to watch the video. It was raining pretty smooth on my screen. I, I'm not sure did that work. Or maybe someone can, uh, uh, Schrader, maybe you can uh, mute. Can you tell me, were you able to see a turn stones? In the, in the, Very in the middle. Okay. Yeah, in okay. the middle, yeah. There's yeah. something, hey, yeah. Okay, so may, I, I have a few more. Maybe I'm gonna just skip the rest of the videos. Just focus on yeah, the- yeah, you, can try, you can try them. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but okay. try them. All right, yeah. great. Thank you. Now, the, um, the other part is very close by our house. It is so close. From our driveway, I joke into people. All I need to do is make one turn and I am at the park. One turn, I just go one turn straight, I am at the park. That's Anthony Chabot Regional Park. It is a wonderful park to visit during the springtime to see many migrating birds. Um, James Watts, another dear friend, 
he is a tremendous, outstanding, very knowledgeable brother. He recommended this park to me, and he took me to this park, and I am very grateful he introduced this place to me. It's, every time I go, I rarely see a, 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 a birders or wildlife photographer. I almost never see any wildlife photographer go to this park. Maybe it is too close to my house or something, but I fall in love with this park because during the early springtime, when you walk down that wooded trail, tree bushes all around you, you just walking down, you see Allen's hummingbird, you see Rufus hummingbird perching right next to you that without you even notice. It's amazing. So I was able to get some really close up shots. It was not like I tried to get close to them because they got really close to me. Sometimes it's so close, I had to move back. Sometimes I go out birding. I need some quiet time. I'm sure we all do that. Need some long time, downtime to ourselves. And for me, each morning is a new day for me, a new experience. And for me, a bird walk is exercise to keep me, keep my health, uh, a body healthy. This is another wonderful location, Nels Canyon staging area, a great place to looking for wood ducks. I believe it was the, the first place I saw wood ducks. And um, I know some people say when they're to look for wood duck, I think my hitting percentage is maybe 30%. So I go there every three times, I see wood duck once. But I'm sure Jerry, some other guys, they are, have a much higher batting percentage. But my batting percentage is 30% of the time. When I go to this location, I see a wood duck. And I was there and I was quietly observing them. And I saw this uh, appear wood ducks. The male wood duck showing the love, caring, compassion for his partner. You can see she, and she was enjoying this having her eyes closed, enjoy his affection. Well, he was rubbing her head and neck, kissing and rubbing the head. It was a tender moment that I truly enjoy burning. The Val in Livermore, that is a place I will not recommend to go during the middle of the summer. It's hot, very hot. So I go there during the springtime and the fall. And on this day, um, and I believe it was at Jerry's one of Fremont Birding Walk. And it was the first time I saw the yellow bill magpie at that location. And then I go back a few more times without disappointing. They were there welcoming me. And they, uh, they let me to do some bird in fly shots and they are magnificent. Another place you can see them uh, that I know is Vargas Plateau, right at the parking lot. You park your car, just wait, and hopefully they will show up. So that is the two places I know you can have a high percentage finding this bird. This was from a couple years ago. Most of my photos are recent, but this was a little bit older. I think it's about two years old, two years old, three. It was my first time and the only time ever seen an American Dipper. He weighs swing in this turbulence, kind of rocky stream, like cascading in the shade area. And I was very lucky that he just, some sunlight just go pin through the, the tree branches and he landed just at the right place give me some light, able let me to take some not so high ISO photos. And I thought this is a really cute bird and I've never seen him again. And I went back every year around the same time, I walk along the stream, I never saw, I never find it again. Hopefully I will see him again one year.
at the Sano Regional Wellness. Um, I like to play this video very quickly, uh, see if this thing works. I want to talk about, we all like, many of us like to get that so-called trophy shot. That's always nice. But as each year go by, I feel that I really don't know about the birds that I've been photographing. I feel that I need to learn more about their behavior, their habitat, the environment. So instead of just taking pictures of those birds, I want to get acquainted with them. I want to know them better. And one thing I would highly recommend, and it is from my good friend, Arnold Joe. He has a tie chart on his smartphone. I never had a tie chart. I thought that's for the people go fishing. Actually, he was a fisherman, that's why. And a tie chart tells you the tie at a certain location. This way, you know the shore bird, are they gonna be coming closer to the shore or moving away? When the tide is coming in or going out, so you can prepare to know what the bird will do. It is a pattern. It is a behavior that you learn to using the tide chart. And it was very helpful. Using the tide chart, I can gauge in when the tide will come in. So on this day, I look at a, my tide chart on my smartphone. I went out, went to my nearby Hayward shoreline, and I saw this black, oh, actually, this is Alameda uh, uh, shoreline, sorry. And I saw this black belly clover. I spent over an hour with this bird. And while the tide was receding, I watched it hold the ribbon worm out of the mud flat and walk over to a puddle of water and drop it, shake it, rinse it, rinse it clean, get rid of all the dirt, then eat it. I never knew that behavior. They're like a human. They know pick up the food. There's a dirt, you need to clean it off. I hope this video will play and show you Due this to the better. time, I know, due to the time, I know uh, actually that video, later on, immediately after that, he picked up, he pulled out another worm and rinse it again. The second one was even better. But due to the, due to the time, I'm going to skip it. And later on, I will talk about where you can see all my videos. I have a YouTube channel as well. I'm going to talk about this uh, Lake Temescal. It's a hidden gym on top of Oakland Hills. It's a small little park with a sandy beach for the local residents to enjoy the summer swimming. On this day, I saw this mama pipe bell grip, catching crayfish and feeding the young. The seasons, the four seasons, lovely four seasons. I love the fall. During the fall, you can get some fantastic photos. I'm gonna speed up, I'm gonna skip fuel of them. I'm watching the time right now because I only got one hour, right? Well, what time I must stop at 7.30, 8.30. I only got half hour. I need to talk fast. Okay. okay. Five, 10 uh, minutes here and there. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, for many years, I thought the only place to see white face ibis was at the woodland because that's where all the wildlife photographer goes to, at the woodlands, water treatment center. So when the people say to me, oh, that place is getting, the, the ponds got dried up. 
I was so disappointed. I have no idea where to look for. Little did I know. Correct me if I'm wrong. White faced ibis is actually is not a migrating bird. They live here year around. They are always here. But how come I never seen them? I thought the only place was woodland. In fun, then I learned the behavior. Where they like to be at? They like to be at the rice field that has water. Any kind of farm field with water. And look, they may be there. So those photos they're taking, what I was driving in the Central Valley, looking for the rice field, looking for the farm with water. And sure enough, I find many uh, a white face ibis on this field that was able to photograph them. All right, it was near the summertime. Weather was getting warm. So that morning, I had no expectation and I really just want to go out do some hiking. And where is a good place to do some hiking? Vargas Plateau. Again, this place was introduced from the Bur Fremont Birding Walk. Uh, Fremont Birding Circles Walk. Highly, highly recommended. And um, by the way, the current leader of the monthly walk is Jason. Fantastic guy, nice guy, talented, smart, knowledgeable. You, you will have a wonderful time. Walk along with him. And they do the walk once a month on the first Saturday. And or you can go to their Facebook to look at their uh, uh, event and no registration required. Here I am without any expectation. I was walking, mostly it was hiking. And I went on to the top of the ridge, overlooked the whole Bay Area. Beautiful view. But along the way, I saw some beetles on the hillside. Then I start hearing some interesting thin buzz call. It's very thin, very thin sound. And it's kind of different. I started looking around and then I saw a few grasshopper sparrows. It was a lifer for me. The photo may not be fantastic and I did not have my big lens with me, and, but it was a lifer. It was a walk that I had no expectation. I had no idea grasshopper was there, but I was able to hear some interesting, funny sound. And I knew birds like beetles. So I start, I stop hiking, I look around. Sure enough, I find a life bird, lifer. It is one more reason why I love birding because the unexpected surprises. You know, it's October. What's October? October, November. It is time for Sand Hill Crane. I am sure many of you or most of you or all of you being to Central Valley and Consumers River and all those places, you looking for the early morning or the sunset. It is a beautiful place. Just watch out for the mosquitoes. Um, I love go to that place and photographing this majestic looking bird. And I was just there a couple of weeks ago and with a dear friend, Don, and Don and I, and we saw some, and, but it was very dry. They were really far. So I'm hoping they will fill up the water on those uh, 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 field so they can be a little bit closer so we can observe them closer. You know, we have a soft heart for the babies. We all love babies. But sometimes I had to tell myself, am I too close to them? On this overcast morning, I was burning on the San Lorenzo Bay Trail, not too far from our house. I did not know, because it was in the, uh, uh, this was in like uh, uh, um, August. I did not expect to see black net still. And my target bird that morning was the red neck uh, ferros. Phillips, did I say, I hope I said that right, but I hope you got the idea. Anyway, but I saw those cute babies and I was so surprised. I said, this is August. 
I thought they're going to have baby in the springtime. But anyway, not only I saw two babies, there's an egg have not even been hatched yet. It was a price, a priceless moment. But I was on the, I was, you can see this, this photo. I was shouting from top because I was on the trail high, looking down. That mind came to me say, hey, Peter, that, 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 that slope wasn't too steep. You can just walk right down, get to the eye level, get a award-winning shot of those baby and with the eggs, egg. But you know something? At the same time, my other side telling me, says, Peter, mom and dad's there. They are young babies. There's an egg. You need to step back. You need to walk away. So I actually took those photos without going down and I move on, Continue, continues my walk, walk. The temptation was there. Should I get a better shot or leave them alone? And the decision was leave them alone. I move on. Bush Peak Preserve in Livermore. It's another not very well known location with rolling hills. On this day, while walking on a gravel path, for the first time in my life, a kill deer flew right in front of me and landed right in front of me. Flipped its wing, pretending it was injured, flapping its wing and screaming. I go, whoa, what happened? But then immediately I remember a birder told me once, and I also read, when you see a kill deer flapping, uh, 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 land in front of you, flip over, flapping the wing, that tells you you're too close to the nest. The kill deer did that to distract me. I was too close to her nest. She was really worried. So what did I do? I knew I may be stepping, take one more step, the, the, the eggs may be there because kill deer lay their eggs right at the open ground on the gravels. They are not on the tree, they're on the ground. I may be just looking right at it. But I saw the mom kill deer was screaming and flapping the wing, pretending to be injured. She is under stress. The best thing for me to do, walking backward. I, I did not want to continue my walk because I don't want to step on the nest, the, the, the eggs. So I walked backward, walked backward. So on that day, did I get a kill deer baby? No. Did I get the, the, the nest shot? No. I got nothing that day. But you know, I was rewarded. I saw those cute American coo babies next to it. So I got some nice photos of those uh, American uh, 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 coo babies instead of the kill deer babies. Three horns, they are irresistible. We all love all kinds of owls. And on this wet morning, and we spot this male adult great horn owl, dry itself. And I thought it was a pretty interesting shot. And believe it or not, I got this shot at a friend's backyard. So this, this, this owl decided to a uh, uh, nest on my friend's backyard. So we went there, we got a shot. Elsie Romer, bird century in Alameda is another great place for bird watching. Fantastic, a lot of birds there. And, um, but when you go there, please pay a little bit more attention surrounding because this place is right next to a very busy street. Um, with all the robberies, everything. I put my camera in, not in a camera bag, but I have a standard looking student backpack. So I put my camera in a student backpack. So hopefully people thinking uh, 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 there's nothing there. So I get to there, then I take my camera out. When I leave, I put my camera back into my student backpack and walk away. And I do the same thing with San Francisco Golden Gate Park as well. Early morning lighting is magical. It can be very dramatic and very and creating the mood. A while ago, 
I start paying more attention to the lighting on my photo subject. And I try to go out a little bit earlier. Um, I try to catch that golden hour lighting. And um, some of the early morning, when we get to our destination, we may be the only people, or I may be the only one at the park, at a location. The peacefulness, the quietness, our surrounding, and I truly enjoy that. So I can spend some quality time with the birds. And here's the um, ground pelican. Um, one of them is morphing into the mating color. And uh, so I was able to ca capture the color in a very dramatic way. Not too long ago, I think it was just last month or so, uh, I think a lot of people went to Charleston Slough. And I rarely go there because that's on the other side of the bay. I don't go there a lot. But I did my, I made a rare visit across the bay, hoping to see the black skimmer that everybody was talking about. And when I got there, I noticed that all the many, many photographers with tripods and birder all lined up and uh, looking on the right side, that was the, uh, uh, the black skimmers. But then I, as the sun's going down, I look into the left side and I saw the sunlight reflection, the lighting hitting on the uh, uh, pelican, the, 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 the white pelican. It was so gorgeous. So I had to go to the other side to take in the picture of this pelican. At the end of the day, my best shot was not the black scammers. It was this beautiful looking white pelican. So for me, when I, even though I have a target bird, I look around because there are other opportunities come along, maybe giving me even better photo and the burning experience. Speaking of the, the, the lighting, then I start, start working with available lighting. Lighting was not so great. Here, a gray ghost gracefully gliding on over a open field on an early evening. And due to the darkness, it created an interesting background instead of my standard blue sky. And I was just happy my camera was out of focus, able to lock on the subject and get a very clear shot. And another late afternoon image. This is from our backyard. And uh, the lighting casting on the red tail hawk perching on the eucalyptic tree that's behind our backyard in the neighbor, neighbor's yard. And I took this photo from our upstairs balcony and I was able to capture this with a very dramatic lighting. Here's another one uh, experimenting with backlit lighting and you can see the dust flying off. <clears throat> and sometimes the birds in a complete shade area and for me, it is also very fun to observing them, to photographing them, because I don't need to worry about the highlight, the white blowout, or harsh shadows, and the colors are very even. And I, the, when I do that, I position myself, hoping I can get something a little bit brighter background so I can have a better contrast with my subject and the background. Uh, I took a... I wanted to learn more about bird. So I took a class from Golden Gate Audubon Society, um, the niece class about the birding by ear. And I wanted to learn more about the bird ID. And when I post this uh, uh, on, the, uh, the, on, on the Facebook and I tag it as the Western King bird. Later on, I got a message from Bob Tolin, uh, Tolin, Toledo. Did I say that way? Bob. And he is another outstanding, fantastic birder with his wife, Julie, that we just had a bird walk uh, at the uh, Point Ray. And he's an outstanding birder. And he told me, you got the wrong ID. And he told me that the, the difference is the, the Western has the white line along the tail on both sides. And my photo does not have it. So it is 
a Kasson Kimber. So those are tremendous knowledge I am learning. For me, it's a lifetime learning process. Another learning process. What's the difference between a snowy egret versus a, a great egret? For a long time, I thought the snowy, it has the crown, the hair sticking out, but sometimes they don't do that. So a good friend, uh, 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 Helen, Helen's another outstanding birder. She told me it's easy to, to, to know. Uh, just think about snow, black, uh, and James also mentioned that. Snow and black, they don't go together, and that, that's what it is. So when you see a bell, a beak is black, that's snowy. And so that the golden one, that is the great, uh, 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 great uh, uh, egret. And speaking of that, how do you identify? I always had a long time, uh, cannot figure out the difference between Western Brit with Clark. Again, Helen told me that's easy. Just think about like a Western movie, uh, um, those robbers on, on a stagecoach, they, they had a black mask, tried robbing people. So Western grip has the black mask. He cover his eyes. And Clark grip, black is above the eye. So Western is the Western movie, covered eyes. And I thought that was very clever. And I remembered it. And I shared that was every time when I go out, when I see somebody say to me, say, how can you tell us Western versus Clark? Then I share that story. Credit, go to Helen Keaton. She's fantastic. Okay, you know, uh, I am running out of time. I'm gonna skip some because I have not even get into my main topic. So here's another place. It's a wonderful place for birding. And, and here's another place, uh, 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 Half Moon Bay. I went there looking for shorebird. I ends up saw this bomb. Uh, swallows and uh, and uh, nothing fantastic here, uh, just osprey. And then everybody goes Spring Valley, and uh, those are the common place. All right, now Arnwood. I want to talk about Arnwood. That water fountain is a burst magnet. It is also a wildlife photographer's magnet. Whenever you go, you see a lines of photographers and you see all those wonderful birds. That did something to me. That one, I call that the water fountain effect. That effect got me. I want that magical fountain in my own backyard. If any one of you has never been there, you need to go to experience it, to understand what I'm talking about. It is almost like a spiritual experience to see birds singing in the sky over this water fountain. I start thinking about how to stealing this water fountain to my house. I want to bring that experience to my own backyard. I want to create a bird butterfly sanctuary. I want to convert our backyard just like Arnwood, so I can enjoy the same thing. But you know, guys, timing is good because right now Arnwood, uh, due to the avian uh, pox, they shut down the water fountain. And uh, so if you go there, there's no water. But uh, guess what, guys? My backyard water fountain is still running beautifully. Later on, I will show you. By the way, I want to say, uh, all, 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 all those uh, uh, photos that uh, you are looking at from here on now, they are all from my from our backyard. This Western Kinninger, all those are from our backyard. If we build it, it will come. Kevin Costner, 1989, I believe that was the year. A few all dream. If you build it, they will come. Yes, that was my strategy. I'm gonna build it a place providing the food and the water. And the bird, they should come. How cool would that be? Birding without leave your house. And by the way, uh, this butterfly bush, if you'd like to have butterfly, please plant it. 
butterfly loves it. That's why it's called a butterfly bush. And during the process, the planning, I made a lot of mistakes, a lot of mistakes. And I'm not a gardener. And actually, I, I hate to do gardening work. work. For all those times, I rarely step outside our own backyard until I start burning. Because like I said, in the past, on my weekend, instead of whacking the grass in my own backyard, I'm whacking the grass on a golf course, on the fairway or in the rough, playing golf. So I rarely go to the backyard. But now I suddenly, I say, I need to figure out how to planting flowers, all those stuff. And during the whole process, I will show you, I lost almost 25 pounds. So that was the side benefit that I lost a lot of weight from doing this. But when I start doing this, I noticed, oh, I got a problem. We got a problem. Our new wood is flat, but our house is on a slope. Nothing flat in our house or the yard. Our new wood is big. Our house, from the shortest distance of from our house, I measured, I walked 10 steps. I am already at the neighbor's fence. 10 steps. That's not even big step, small steps. Big problem. What should I do? I start thinking, we need to maybe scale down my vision. Maybe forget about this remodeling. I will never have this artwork effect in my own backyard. Maybe I just put out some sugar water, maybe put some bird feeders and call for the day. I'm done. So I start discuss with my CFO, my boss, my dear wife. She said, you know, Peter, we got rats in our attic. We got rats in our garage. We got rats in our furnace closet. And we even had a rat living in my car for a long time until I had to take it for service to clean it out. So my wife said to me, say, hey, you know, Peter, if you put in the sugar water, put in especially the seeds out in our yard, we're gonna have a rat's party. I'm not sure that's gonna work. So that idea got killed right away. Beginning the process. That's our lovely backyard. How lovely can that be? You can see it was a complete slope. And the slope's not even going down. It was going up. Our house is on the low end. So we had to break our backyard building, retaining wall, level it. Because in the past, it was on a slope. Anything we plant, it died. Because the water will never stay there. So the summertime, all the plants died. We had a real ugly yard for a long time. And nothing beautiful here. But we start a process. And this is a few months later. It's getting looking good. You can see we got some small plants we planted there. On the top left-hand corner, that was my version of a poor man's water feature. I put a planter saucer on top with a rock, put some water. That was my so-called Arnwood fountain. And you know, it actually worked. I got birds coming for bad. But then that's where the problem came. Each day, I noticed that we got some plant die. And I pick up the dead plant. I picked it up. There's no roots underneath it. It's all gone. Then I realized inside the house, we got rats. Outside, we got moats, votes, and gophers. Gopher holes everywhere. Anything I plant, it died. So I had to redo this again. So I got this galvanized chicken wire. I had to lay underneath it, the, 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 the underneath it, then putting the plants on top. And then I read somewhere that you can buy those stuff device on Amazon. It creating some buzz sound. So those, uh, those creature underground, underneath it, they don't like it, they want to move away. But I'm a cheapskate, so I go, you know, I went to the dollar store, I got those uh, wing wheels, 
And when they, and I put a little uh, 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 middle there. So when they, when they turn, you go da, 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 sound. And you know something guys, it worked fantastic. And knock on the wood, all those creatures underneath the, the, the ground, within a year, they all disappeared. Here you are guys. This is what it, my yard looked like currently. From you saw the before, all the dirt. Now we got a bird paradise, oh, not bird paradise, we got a garden. We got flowers. We got, it's, I feel so wonderful going out there. I even put a, 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 a camera, a 24 seven recorder. So even when I am away, on vacation, traveling. I can anytime to check my water fountain, see what kind of bird in my backyard. Home away from home, I can check on my water fountain. My, I got my water fountain can, camera. Here are some, uh, again, I'm gonna kind of skip all of this. Um, those are the plants that we plant. Not all of them, but some of them that uh, uh, well attracting hummingbirds and right there. So we got almonds, we got Rufus, um, and of course, Anna. And I, I wanna stop here pointing out this uh, uh, honeysuckle, okay, the honeysuckle. Because this, this plant, it flowered multiple times in one season and it flowered during the winter time. And Rufus, they're migrating to the Bay Area is always around early springtime. In the early spring, many of the flower, they have not bloomed yet. But this honeysuckle, they are in full blooming. It is one and I plant 10 of, I start out with three, four, five. Later on, I line up my whole backyard with this. I plant 10 of this uh, flower. So uh, at one year, we have five Rufus hummingbirds. And we get Anna's, or we get Alan's all the time. I know a lot of people travel too far to looking for Alan or Rufus. I just stay at home. They're there. And highly recommend to plant this. You, you, you want to plant, they, they don't stand very still. So you want to, you want to plant this against a, a fence, something for support. And you want to trim that every year to trim the top off, it grow right back. And it give you tremendous enjoyment and more flowers, and more plants, and the uh, prime Madeira, and I plant them, put a planter, so when they flower, I move to the water feature so I can photograph it. When the flower die, I move them away. So I can give varieties of flower for my background. And I, I plant toyong berries, wash, uh, watching the hawthorn, uh, coffee berry, Japanese cheese wood, and few other uh, plants. I chop down trees, some smaller tree. I chop them all down and replant those trees that bear fruits that bird like. So I do not even put, I don't need to put out bird feeders, any of those things, because it's organically, uh, 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 naturally producing food for the birds. And it's wonderful to see all the birds coming in. Another thing I want to talk about is that the location. And if you can place the, the whatever you want to photograph at north. And this one, it, my water feature is, is north. So I'm setting from the south. So this way I get sunlight all day long. I can get a morning and afternoon lights from the side, noon from behind me. So basically, from the morning I wake up, I can go to my backyard, start photographing them, coming to the water fountain, water feature, and I can photograph them. And some of the birds are more shy. So I even uh, uh, bought a, 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 a cover so I can hide myself inside to taking pictures. And another thing is this is the view from our kitchen. From our kitchen sink, you look out and you can see our water fountain is so wonderful doing the dishes and then see all the birds coming in. And I have a, on the top, you can see I have a camera. So I record them 24 hours a day so I can watch them. 
And to, to conserve water, I built a water irrigation system. I put a solar panel so I don't use any electricity. Here is a QR code. You can use a smartphone. You can scan this. Uh, you are, uh, if you're interested, you, if you are a handy person, I, I, will, I have the step-by-step -step in all the, 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 the elements to put together what I did for this uh, water fountain. And one thing I did is different than any other fountain that I've never seen. Because when I was younger, uh, we had a, a koi pond in the backyard. A koi pond, you need to have a filter. You need to have filterization to clean the water. So my, my this uh, 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 water fountain, I actually have a water, uh, 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 water filter built in. So all the water going in is filtered. It's clean water going in, come back out. And every week I clean that filter. And another thing, the, the, the saucer, I clean that water daily. And I clean my water fountain uh, every, every 15 days. And the water is basically always clean due to the, uh, the filter I, I built, built inside, it's inside. And I'm gonna quickly to show you some other birds and the uh, lesser goldfinch came to the water fountain. Buick ran came to our uh, uh, water fountain. Hunt Oriole, Fox Sparrow, Pacific Slow Flycatcher, Pine Siskin, that was that one last year. Uh, for once, I think maybe the wildfire, they all came to the Bay Area. So we have a lot of Pine Siskin in our backyard. Red Breast, Nut Hatch. And another thing you probably noticed that some of the photos, they look like you photographed it uh, from in a natural environment. And because I put those, uh, when I do the yard work, I have those uh, dead branches, I just stick them around the water features. So I noticed the behavior is that the, when the bird comes, they always land a little bit higher and then they slowly gradually come to perch at the branch, I set it up and then they go to the water fountain drinking or take a bath. After they take a bath, they always go back to the tree branch that the branch I set up, they dry themselves so I can photograph some more, then they flew out. So they give me multiple opportunities in different stages for me to photograph them. And ruby crown kinglet, warbling vario, a beautiful, beautiful bird, very shy, and but they do come to our backyard. I and I, I just got one last week, the first of the season. Western tanager, yellow wobbler. Western wood peewee, Hutton vario, Townsend's wobbler, bush tit. They are fun. When they come, they come with a bench. They come like a five, six, ten of them. They all jump into the to the water fountain, not water fountain, the, the, the pool, like, like a pool party, or splashing water, making a lot of sound, and jumping around, and then jump onto the, the branch and jumping down. It's total party. It's so fun to watch them. Yellow round wobbler, this one you can see, beautiful feather. It was, it just finished taking the bath. It came out, dry itself. And I took in the picture. Cedar wax wing, Herman Strash, Wilson wobbler. And we have many butterfly, like I mentioned, butterfly uh, uh, bush and many other plants. And we also have Northern Flicker, Nato Woodpecker, Red Breast, Subsucker, and many other birds that have been to our backyard. And uh, uh, I think I'm gonna skip this video. Um, uh, you can see uh, uh, I photograph the hummingbirds come to the water fountain. And one thing good about it is that when you go to Ardenwood, you get what you get. And whatever the water they, they, they put there, that's all. But here is mine. So I can control the water flow. I can control uh, how much water coming out. So I can have the finer driplets and I can, so when the birds, when the 
when the when there's less water and uh, the hummingbird was actually I, maybe I just do a real real quick one. This is really cute. This is at near end of the day. The solar panels are low, no longer working fully, maybe at a 10%. So very few water. And I, I noticed that every evening, hummingbird always come to our backyard. They knew the water level is low. Seems like they are getting their jacuzzi or something. They, they could be spending minutes there. And I can spend minutes watch them. Can you guys see that? I hope you guys see it. Yeah, it's, it's really good. Cool, thank you. And I got, I got some more, but I'm gonna skip it. And I got many, many uh, 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 videos. I got seed wax wheat in the yard and all those stuff. Uh, let me see, uh, how do I, how do I, uh -oh, how do I get out of here? Okay, now, um, like I said, I have a lot of videos. Uh, I'm not able to share with you all here. But I do have a YouTube channel. The name is Stone Water Wildlife. And hopefully you can go to my YouTube and follow me there to see many of my backyard birding videos. Also, the places I visit, you can follow me there. And I also have a lot of photos that I post on Instagram, it is a new media I start using now. I just started uh, 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 early this year that I post some of my photos. The reason I post there because after I won the Audubon Photography Award, they asked me about my Instagram account. I said, uh, I don't have an account. They said, well, that's where we made the announcement. But that's where we feature the photos. So I had to open an account for this Audubon Society Award thing. That's what I did, so they can see it. Last but not least, I wanna give a big thanks to my beautiful, beautiful wife. Thanks to her, she's our CFO. Thanks for her budget, allow me to spend the money to converting our backyard. Thank you. That's my presentation. Wow, Peter, this is amazing. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I, I want to open it up for uh, for questions because I'm sure there are lots of questions and lots of feedback. So shall I lock off now? No, Can no, I... you, you're okay. You're okay. No, no, not lock off. Shall I uh, not sharing anymore? Because I don't I, need to yeah, share. Yeah, you, you my... can you can stop sharing. Yeah, you can stop sharing. Let me see, how do I do that? So there should be a button at the bottom of your screen. You know something, I'm not gonna do anything because okay, I don't wanna, right. okay. wanna screw it up. That's okay. Um, so you're getting a lot of uh, fantastic comments on the chat. Uh, they're saying terrific presentation. Uh, thank you, Peter, very informative. Um, a few people want to come over to your backyard and I'm, I'm one of them. So I think we'll start showing up in your backyard, Peter. And I know you're also a good cook, so we might be expecting some lunch and dinners too. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of people who want to come to your backyard actually. Um, and, and what I did, uh, uh, in fact, is I took some screenshots uh, as you were speaking uh, for the DIY, uh, right? I can, I can send that around to people in case they want to take a, take a photograph. Uh, and and your website, the uh, you know, the Instagram and and YouTube as well. I'll I'll send that information as an email. Questions, people. I'm sure I'm sure they have a lot of. Yeah, everybody is congratulating you on a great presentation. This is just fantastic. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Go ahead, please. Sorry. Peter, what um, camera and uh, lens are you using now? Okay. Um, currently, currently, um, I am using Sony A1. And the lens I'm using is Sony 200 to 600 
and 600 prime plants currently. And prior, I was using Nikon D500 and 500 PF. And before that, I start burning with Canon. So I jumped from Canon to Nikon to Sony. But I do want to say something. I still love my Nikon. And I still feel like Nikon uh, 500 PF is one of the best lens uh, ever made. It's light and sharp. And I hope, I am hoping, um, but current uh, Nikon Z9 is a little bit too big. I like mm -hmm. more smaller camera to fit my hand. So I'm hoping they will come up with a, a Nikon Z9 like, but it's in a more compact size. So I can go back to using Nikon. I really like, like the Nikon interface better than so. Yeah. Yeah, I have a D850 with the 200 to 500 and um, haven't thought about getting the 500 yet because I'm thinking about now going to the uh, mirrorless. So, you know, even if you move to mirrorless with a adapter, all your mm -hmm. uh, lens will work. Right. I have and, a D6 and I just don't have a good lens. Well, the, fi the 200 uh, to 500 yes. work okay, works okay with it. But um, it doesn't really work with the um, with the teleconverter. It, it, it's really hard uh -huh. to focus. Teleconverter, no, it does mm -hmm. not work. No. Yeah. That's one thing about Nikon and on the older DSLR, the teleconverter, even the 1.4, never worked for me. I almost never use converter. But I heard that the Nikon's the mirrorless uh, converters are much superior. Right, I heard that as well. Yeah, I, I know it was a waste of five hundred dollars to get the the one point four. Yeah, mm. yeah especially if when the first time you bought it, you thought something's broken. Yeah, yep. Clink, 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 clink. Yep. Oops. Yeah. Hey, hey, Peter. Um, Lila is asking, how do you store your photos and videos? Uh, six, uh sorry, I was. Hold a second. You Can you repeat the question again? Sure. Lila is asking, how do you store all your photos and videos? How do I store? Yes. Okay. Costco. I get all my hard, uh, external hard drive from Costco. Uh, they are cheap. And I don't know. Uh, um, so far, they all work. Um, what I've been doing is that I buy those... Um, uh, those Costco, uh, um, those uh, uh, Seagate, no, whatever they call it. Mm. Uh, uh, so what I do is that I, every year I buy two. I name it uh, 2022, one, 2022, back up. So I do all my work on my computer. Once I finish it, I move and I, 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 I delete all the files I don't need it. And I move them, make a copy onto one of the external drive and then move to the second backup. And then I just, uh, 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 then I do that. So, so then I have, so every year I have two. Wow. Uh, everybody has their own way, uh, but that's how I do it. And I find that's the most affordable way. Uh, and I have two mm -hmm. copies. And on my computer, I almost have no files. And I just finish my work and I just dump it over. And for the videos, I don't save any of my videos. I put them all onto the YouTube. And I, I, I trust YouTube more than I trust myself. So, so uh, I think I probably will lose my, my file before YouTube will lose it. And I figure YouTube, well, they have backup over backup over backup. So I, uh, um, and because the video file is big, and I really see, once I load it to the YouTube, I really see no reason for me to keep it. So I delete all my YouTube uh, uh, videos. I'm not YouTube. I delete all my videos, videos. on my own hard drive. And I do not save any. I, I, I trust YouTube. Huh. And, and then, Peter, there's lots of uh, congratulations on a great presentation. Very, 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 uh, very nice feedback. Um, Linda said, I missed um, 
must have missed in the first few minutes, but there is Peter's backyard. This is your house, correct? This is exactly where you are. The backyard is your house. Uh, yeah, it's where I'm at right now. I just walk out to the yard. Yeah. I, I think she might be asking, where do you live? Like which area of the Bay Area do you live? Oh, where I live? You, you want an address? <laughs> well, we're coming for barbecue, so we might as well get your address. Um, I live in Castro Valley, okay. East Bay. And I know this is a South Bay group. So most of you guys are South Bay. And you probably saw my, you probably noticed that in my presentation, I almost have no South Bay locations because I rarely go to South Bay. I rarely go to the other side. I burning mostly in the East Bay because there are so many parks that I have not even had a chance to explore. So I have not really had the opportunity to venture out, except I do follow the rare bird report when I see something like a, a month ago when they had the, what I call the, the, the roast breast, grass beak uh, in uh, South Bay. Uh, I've never seen one, so I had to go there to check it out. Yeah. But my normal birding, I stay mostly East Bay or during the migrating season, Central Valley, and go to North. Okay. Jeffrey is saying, uh, I have a feral cat that visits my backyard. Would a bat attracting birds be too dangerous for the birds? You think it's um it's not good uh, if a cat is visiting the backyard to have a bird bath? Uh, we 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 uh we used to adopt our neighbor's cat. He came to our backyard a lot, and I knew the cat was looking. You, you can tell a cat is hunched down. They are looking. So I know whenever I see it, I had to chase him out. Especially, we do have a, a cat. I like to walk around the water fountain. I get very scared. How to avoid them? I, I have no solution. Interesting. And he's also asking, where did you see the grebes? Uh, where to see the, the grebes? Yes. Uh, you mean this photos, uh, the, the photo I'm sharing right now? I, I think you had a... I, he, he didn't clarify, but I think this is one of them. And you also had the pipe bill creep at one place. Oh, pipe bill creep. That was at the bush, bush something, uh, uh, bush peak. Yeah, bush peak in uh, uh, Livermore. Bush peak, Livermore. Okay. And, and what about this, this creep here, the Western creep? This is at uh, uh, um... Palero. Calero, yes. Thank Calero, you. Calero Reservoir in San Jose. Yes, San Jose. Okay, so Kumar is asking uh, almost the same question. How do you keep cats out of your backyard? Uh, sorry, yeah. no answer. Maybe get a dog. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, I don't um, think dog eat cat, uh, birds. <laughs> no. oh, oh, well. Robin, Robin Chen is saying, come to the South Bay and bird with us. I think, you know, that's, yeah, you're right. Um, Peter, with your photography skills, I'm sure you'll get a fantastic, uh, lots of really good shots here. Thank you. So um, Scott, Scott is saying, Rose Bristed Grass Peak is at Agnes Historical Park. Agnes, Agnes Historical Park. Rose Bristed Grass Peak, I think he was, trying to help you with an answer there. Um, Eun says, I'm sorry, I'm just reading it out, but Eun says your injury was a big loss to the world of golfing, but a big gain for us birders. I, I agree. I agree. Thank you. I mean, yeah, that was really, really nice. You took up birding. Well, one, well, one thing is that eight years ago, if someone said to me saying, Peter, one day you're going to become a birding, birder, photographer, I was saying, you are so funny. It's not even funny. 
because that's not going to happen because I'm going to be a lifetime golfers. I follow Tiger Woods. I watch every PGA golf tournaments. And whenever there are tournaments in the Bay Area, I go to those tournaments. I go, I went to Pebble Beach. I go to all those places. I spend those money because that was my passion. And I know everything wow. about golf clubs. You ask me, I can sell you clubs. That was my life. I got a golfer outfit. You saw the, you saw the, uh, see, that's, yeah. that's a golfer outfit. You know, funny looking guy in this uh, <laughs> funky clothes, shorts. I mean, nobody's going to walk around like that anymore, you know, but that's a golfer's thing, you know, mm -hmm. so I, I, I got rid of all those. Now I, I, I'm got this right here. You all know, the birds. Like, yes. now I'm a birder now. So <laughs> you, never know. you never know. It take a, a bad knee to become a birder, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I want to say, um, you know, Cindy here said something that I, I, I really appreciate. And I, I think I mentioned this in the beginning. Uh, Cindy says, really appreciate your restraint in backing off nesting birds, like the stills and the killdeers and so on. Wish all photographers would realize that the bird's life is more important than the picture. And uh, when I introduced Peter, this is something that I learned from him on day one. Uh, this is something that he was very particular uh, he had seen me for the first time and you know he was just looking at me we were just photographing you know very very carefully and he says the same thing to all of us around him you know it's not your picture that is important just keep in mind this is for the birds right i think so this is something that i really appreciated from day one in you peter so really thank you thank you for educating thank all of us much. along the way yeah yeah it is it is my true belief that yeah. Um, because sometimes I'm thinking, I know the true birders, they do not think of me as the birder. They say, you are a photographer. Right. But then the photographer say, Peter, you are not a photographer. You are a birder. <laughs> so I am a hybrid. And I think many of you are hybrid. But as a yeah. hybrid, how do we get along? As a hybrid, how can we learn from each other? Yep. And there are many things that we can do. And as a photographer's mentality is that I want to get that trophy shot. Regardless, I want to get that trophy picture. But as a birder, they don't want to get that trophy shot. First of all, they do not use a camera. They take a scope, they see it, they walk away. I want to talk about my friend Arnold. Arnold is more like a birder than a photographer. When I go out birding with him, he captured the picture, he moved on. And I still stay back there. I said, Arnold, don't go, don't go, stay here. Then he's all, he said, don't you have enough? Don't you got thousands of pictures already? Then he's kind of want to move on. I'm learning from him that even though I may not have the shot, but there's always a next day. There's another opportunity. But let's respect the bird we enjoy the most. How many times you heard about people who abuse the birds? The birds never return. We never have another opportunity to get that shot again. Let's don't do that. Yep. Hopefully they will return next year and we have another opportunity. But for me, even though if I do not get the picture, that's okay. I don't mind. Because for me to go out is exercise. I walk my 6,000 6, steps, minimal, daily. I, I, go, I count, I say 6,000, okay, time to go home. <laughs> it's not how many births I hit. So a lot of people say, I wanna get 10, 20, 30. No. We go out and say, okay, we got our steps, go home. It, yeah. Tomorrow, we repeat this again. Peter, I want to I want to uh, close out by one question that Jerry asked. I think it's also very very important, um, and this might be the last question we'll we'll ask you today. But he's saying, what would be one single most important thing you will advise a newbie bird photographer based on your experience? So if you have to just give one one ex one advice to a new bird photographer, what will that be? One advice, very simple. 
join your local Audubon Society. Regardless where you live, there's always a chapter near you. Join that society, that chapter near to you. Don't go to a place and say, oh, my friend uh, joined that, uh, that Audubon Society, but it may be too far. Join your local Audubon Society was the best thing ever happened to me because each Audubon, they have their weekly walk. You can sign up, join. Yep. And currently I join, I belong to three different Audubon Society within the Bay Area. Bay Area. One thing is a donation. Second, I can uh, know what's the latest. Uh, uh, I like to read their newsletter and uh, also join some other walk. So my advice, oh, not one more advice. Get a, don't get a heavy duty one, get a lightweight binoculars. And I know that a lot of wildlife photographers, they don't have binoculars. With, then they say to me, say, oh, I use the camera to look, but that scope is too narrow, too tight. You, it's difficult to find a bird because when I go out birding, I have no target. I don't know what I'm looking at. It's not like I go to Sandy Wall Lake. I know exactly there are double crest comrades going to come down to eating the fish. So I don't need a binocular. I can just stay there, take a photos. But I, I don't do just that. I go out there to explore. When I'm looking around with my, with my camera, I cannot see anything. I need to listen first, and then you see my binocular. So two things, get an affordable binocular. And don't get the expensive one. Um, um, there's a one brand, gosh. Um, mm. Later on, I will share with you. It's only $250. Okay. And it's a, it, the quality is better than a $1,000 uh, binocular. Uh, 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 I had a, 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 a German binocular cost over a grand. And this $250 for me is as good as, as, as the one I had at the German glass. Uh, um, vortex, did I say that right? Vortex is a green color. Highly recommend it. Get an A by 42 or A by 35 or something. Don't get a 10, 10 is heavy. Get an A by, um, mm -hmm. and then join your local Audubon Society and off you go. You are meet many, many birders, uh, uh, sharing knowledge with you. And um, that's my thank advice. you, thank thank you, Peter. And I think uh, this this program also is supported by the Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society. So that was a really good plug for them. Yes. And one thing one thing you will learn in Audubon Society, which I also do, is uh, when you meet birders, uh, you also learn bird ethics, and that is super critical. I think as photographers, that is one thing we have to keep in mind. So I really appreciate you, you know, sharing that story and. The rest of your photographs, they are just phenomenal. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Oh, of course, we, we really enjoyed it, yes. Yeah, Thank so you. I'll close out here. Uh, and I, I really hope uh, today my recording will work and we should be able to see a recording on YouTube for, for future. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.